how we go through the afternoon, we can adjust things. And look, hopefully when it warms up after the mid-semester break and the holidays, it will, it will actually work properly. But at the moment, it's not working as it should. Now, before we start, I just have a couple of announcements that Nora has asked me to make to you all today. We're in the process of finalising the dates for the winter lecture series. Uh, as soon as we have those dates, we will obviously send them out to all the members. Second, your RAG membership renewal is due in July. Now, Nora has asked me to tell you that she will send out the details of this uh, uh, when the membership is actually due, but she said, please do not pay it before July because it upsets the end of year financial accounts. And we don't want to upset the end of year financial accounts. So if you can just wait till you get the notification. It's not that we don't want your money. Um, we just need you to wait till the end of the financial year. Now, um, hopefully the ses this session will be recorded as we have done the other RAG sessions. So if you want to revisit anything or if there's someone who uh, missed out that you know who's interested. As I said, we are having problems and I'm not 100% sure it's going to record today, but hopefully we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed. And lastly at all, uh, lastly uh, for the moment, the RAG raffle has a special prize uh, this week. There is a book by Guy... Um, de la Boydier. Oh, I hope I got his name right. <laughs> uh, actual signed copy of, of a book that he's donated for us to raffle. So uh, if you haven't got any raffle tickets, you may like to get them in the break. Okay, well, let's get started with our first speaker today, Professor John Melville-Jones. Um, John doesn't really need any introduction, I don't think. He's been teaching and researching at UWA for over 50 years now. And in fact, John was the very first lecturer I had when I turned up at UWA some years ago now. And it still seems a little surreal to me to be not only introducing, to be in a position to be not only introducing John, but to be sharing this session with him. John has spoken previously to the RAG groups about the images of Julius Caesar. I think that was a few years ago, a few years ago now. Uh, and today he's, we're going, he's going to talk to us about the mint of Trajan in Rome. Now, John tells me that more is known about the way coins were minted in Trajan's reign than for any other emperor. And one of the reasons for this is due to several inscriptions that have been discovered at the minor basilica of San Clemente near the Colosseum. The inscriptions shed an interesting light on the actual mint uh, workers themselves. Now, to fill in the details and give us some more information, it's my great pleasure to welcome John to RAG once again. Thank you very much, Sandra. This has been a little bit too exciting with these technical problems. I was reminded of the time when, a number of years ago, I was supposed to be giving a lecture somewhere on ancient Greek sculpture. And I can't remember exactly when, what went wrong. But uh, it went wrong and it couldn't be fixed. And uh, this was to an undergraduate class, so you couldn't go on too long. You had to get out of the lecture room. But, so in the end, I had to try to explain to them what these sculptures looked like, adopting the pose of the Discobolus, <laughs> the, the dying Gaul, you see, and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, do the best I could in the circumstances. Thank goodness this hasn't happened this time. So uh, the administration of the Mint of Rome, well, before I start talking about that, I think something should be said. The Roman archaeology group is now approximately, I don't know the exact date, celebrating approximately its decennalia, its 10-year anniversary, which is really good. And so congratulations to David Kennedy, of course, and of course, again, to all the other people who have been involved, and uh, uh, David Kennedy couldn't have done it by himself. I, I can't mention names because I'm sure I would leave out a few people, but uh, you, you know the sort of people I'm thinking about, the people who keep the, the whole thing going. Anyway, I'm sure that uh, David Kennedy is very happy about this. In fact, he's had a wonderful life. Just imagine, when you're a boy, you decide you want to do something, and when you grow up, grow up you manage to do it. What, what sort of better life can there be than that? And to illustrate this, 
I managed to get the assistance of a hacker. And I got into the Kennedy family photographic archives and found the picture of the young David making his first explorations in archaeology. <laughs> yes, I, I, I thought you'd like that. Yeah. Anyway, now, now uh, the fun's over, I'm getting down to business. The mint of Rome where they stuck the coins was located, first of all, uh, on the top house part of the capital, near the temple of a goddess whom they called Juno Moneta. And uh, Moneta is actually a rather mysterious title. The Romans invented an explanation for it from the Latin word moneo, which means I warn or advise, and attach it to the story of the Gauls trying to uh, uh, climb up the Capitol and assault it in 390 BC when Juno's sacred geese honked and gave them away so they were unsuccessful. But this doesn't really work. First of all, from the purely linguistic point of view, it wouldn't be moneta, it would be monita if it were connected with that word. But also, there were cults of moneta at other places around Rome, two in particular, Vei or Signia. So she was probably an Etruscan goddess who was imported into Rome, moneta meaning whatever, but nothing to do with warning. But this is all had a, 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 a curious sequel because moneta because of the temple of this goddess, then became the name for a mint. And then later on, it became the word for money. So, money comes from an Etruscan goddess. It's funny how words move around. The, the uh, uh, Avarium, lower down on the slopes of the capital, was located in the temple of Saturn. And the Avarium, that literally means the Bondary, the earliest Roman coinage was in bronze, so they kept that, uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, as their money storage place. But the Avarium also became a safe place in which to keep all sorts of things, historical, sacred, whatever. But that's a uh, republic under the early empire. Now, by Trajan's time, we are absolutely certain that the mint, that the mint had been relocated at the bottom of the Caelian Hill, which is to the uh, east of the, uh, of the Colosseum. We don't know exactly when. We feel pretty certain that it followed a fire on the Capitol in AD 80, which probably did a lot of damage, and they might have needed a larger building by then, so they thought, well, we won't repair the mint, we'll shift it somewhere else. And it was certainly there by, uh, uh, by uh, 115, but uh, probably actually moved in Domitian's reign. There's a little bit of a gap in coinage fairly early in Domitian's reign, which is probably the time when they did the shifting. So here we have the Colosseum, as you can see here. And then as you move down here, you get to something called now the Basilica di San Clemente. Saint Clem Saint, it's a minor basilica and St. Clement's Church. And it's underneath that that we think we may have the building that was once the mint. The Basilica di San Clemente is sometimes called the Lasagna Church because it's got so many different layers. Uh, uh, the Basilica on top that you go into now, it's a beautiful building, was built about AD 1100. Then underneath that, there's a fourth century Christian church and then underneath that again, bottom level, there's this building that we think was the mint. So it's quite a long way down. That's the uh, basilica itself. There's entrance courtyard here and then the uh, basilica. So imagine yourselves going into the basilica and uh, uh, then you uh, can walk around and look at all sorts of nice things up there. And it's uh, quite okay for tourists. They have hourly visits going down, right down to the bottom. So if you are in Rome, make a point of visiting the Basilica of San Clemente because 
it will have all sorts of interesting things there for you. Well, here's a plan of this bottom level building. And as you can see, there are some bits that are in solid black and some bits that are in light lines. Those are guesswork. It's an attempt to reconstruct the, uh, uh, the whole thing. And the letter M doesn't stand for mint. It stands for mithraeum because there is a separate building where they had a shrine to the god Mithra. And then the one that is labelled H is the possible mint building. And it's labelled H because some people think it was only a warehouse or granary for which the Latin word is horium. This is a typical horium sort of plan. And it does have, if you look back to this now, you can see the sort of arrangement that you've got with the central open space and lots of little rooms of it. The Horeum, uh, uh, Horea, by the way, lots of people use the plural form Horea for a single building, just as we might say the something or other buildings when it's actually one building in English, but I prefer to make it quite clear that it's a Horeum, singular, not, uh, sep not separate plural buildings. Anyway, the difference is the big difference with this one is that it's got one, two, three, four separate entrances, which for a warehouse or a granary is, is appropriate. Our building here, uh, we're not quite certain where the entrance was, but it certainly wasn't anywhere around here, and probably up at this end. Now, as I said, the building is uh, a bit tentatively reconstructed because uh, for some reason you can't get digging away uh, uh, right, um, right to the very end of it. But if the eastern half matched the western part, it now survives, it would have been about 63 meters long and it couldn't have been longer because there's an ancient road there and about and 29 meters wide, 29 meters, that's 100 Roman feet, so that's understandable, and would have had an internal area of about 1,800 square meters. So that's a pretty big building, and this is one thing that is a little bit worrying. Mints don't have to be all that big, but I'll come back to that question later on. So, uh, so, so, so there we are, and the, the uh, uh, extent of it, well, about 30 rooms on the ground floor, probably, and it did have an upper floor as well. So it, it would, uh, uh, you have to find explanations for this very large building. This is the Mithraeum, by the way. This is what all the tourists go to see. Mithra, or Mithras, as a predecessor of Christianity, very favoured by Roman soldiers. But... Uh, 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 um, that's not the part that's interesting to me. Now, something that helps to show that this building was the mint is a drawing of a lost part of something called the Forma Urbis Roma, the form of the city of Rome. It was a great big marble plan on a wall, created in the time of Supremius Severus, engraved on a number of marble slabs, We've got well over a thousand bits and pieces, and for uh, the experts in this, it's a wonderful sort of jigsaw puzzle. You, just, you try to uh, fit all the bits in in the right places. And some bits that are now lost were the subject of drawings made in the early 16th century, and so some missing pieces, and this is where we've got one that seems to refer to the mint. It's a Codex Vaticanus, you see, it's uh, in the Vatican Library. And it shows something that is almost exactly like one end of this building, with the letters M-O-N. Now, if you try to find a Latin word for the name of a building that begins with M-O-N, you can't find anyone but Moneta. So, uh, but then, of course, uh, there's one little problem if you start counting the rooms here and compare it with the plan, there's one too many. So 
don't, is this important? Because it's a pretty rough plan, really. So, and, and there are quite a few other little mistakes on the form of the city of Rome, the form of Obus Rome, so I think we have to let that one go. But as you can see, there's uh, just uh, one room fewer at that end there. The external walls of the ground floor were constructed in a form that was pretty old-fashioned by the second century AD. You find it very commonly in major republican buildings. There's a, a local stone called tufa, and if you're talking Latin architectural terms, opus quadratum means building with squared off stones like this. It doesn't tell you what sort of stone tufa marble could be anything. But it's, it's pretty solid stuff. And then there is a top course in travertine, which is a much harder, more decorative stone. And then uh, internal walls built in concrete, faced with brick and stone. When in the early 19th century this building was first investigated, the, uh, 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 the people didn't have much idea of how to date these things and thought that the square two for stone, oh, this must go back to the age of the kings, but that's nonsense. And some people have said that it too for didn't really get very much into the Roman Empire, but no, you do find examples. And the possible, or I like to think even probable best explanation is that this building was built as a high security building. So having ground floor walls as thick and strong as that and only one entrance, that rather fits the pattern of a mint. This is not the building itself, because I couldn't get uh, the right sort of, uh, of, of uh, picture, but it's a horium at Ostia, where, as you can see, the external walls were in two blocks like this, and then inside they used concrete <coughs> with uh, uh, a facing in, uh, in, uh, in brick, and uh, that's the same sort of construction as for this building. Here's a photograph which doesn't actually show the two for walls, but it shows some of the walls inside, and this also is significant because it shows connections between some rooms. They weren't actually drawn in on the plan that I've shown you, but on another plan which I haven't shown you, uh, they're shown as gaps in the walls. And in a granary, you wouldn't have connections between the different sections or warehouse because you would want to be able to lock up things separately so that people didn't steal them. As I said, the building had an upper story, but that was completely removed <coughs> when the 4th century church was built. So we don't have any idea of what went on there. But uh, uh, there's enough evidence to show that these arches, not the sort of thing you do for a single story building, that there was uh, an upper floor above there. Now we come to the inscriptions which are the reason for making us quite certain that the mint was in this area. They were found near San Clemente, not in, and they were set up by some of the workers at the Mint of Rome in AD 115. They, uh, they um, were on bases which supported statues, and the statues have all gone, so all we've got is the statue bases with these inscriptions. And uh, the reason for celebrating Trajan's 17th anniversary is, is a bit obscure. My only suggestion is that the mint workers had been doing so well that they wanted to celebrate or do something for the emperor, maybe hoping that they would then do even better, and that they uh, uh, and. Uh, that celebrating his official day of becoming emperor wasn't a bad way to do it. You see, when you think about it, the Dacian Wars, fairly early in Trajan's reign, had brought in an enormous amount of booty, some of which might have been in metal that was turned into coin. And then, as I'll mention later, Trajan engaged in a great recoining program, which again kept them pretty busy. Anyway, these statues represented Apollo Augustus, Hercules Augustus, and Fortuna Augusta, Augustan Fortune. The first two would have represented the emperor 
at Apollo and at Hercules with a realistic portrait head. Uh, that's a fashion which in the first century AD became uh, quite common and it's linked with the idea of not exactly saying the emperor is a god, which in the western part of the empire you wouldn't want to do the eastern part, uh, no problem. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, saying that he's got divine qualities, uh, getting getting halfway there, you see. So so you, you so you do a Hercules or an Apollo with the emperor's portrait on top. The third would have been uh, Fortuna, and of course Fortuna being a female goddess, you wouldn't have put Trajan's head on her, but that's what would have, would have happened with Hercules and Apollo. So here's the statue base for, her, for Hercules. Hercules, Hercules, um, uh, Augusto, Sacrum, a sacred offering to Hercules Augustus. And then you get Felix, the name of the, of the boss of the meeting operation. And um, he's Aug L, he's the Libertus of Augustus, a freedman of Augustus. And then he's Optio, the exactor, manager, and overseer, and he, uh, things like that. And uh, so, this is the sort of thing, we, uh, I haven't got a portrait of Trajan as a god to show you because I, I don't know whether any survive, but here's an example of how you do this sort of thing. This is Claudius. Now, Claudius did not have uh, an athletic Jupiter body with a, with a nicely organized six-pack or anything like that, you see. And so to put his head on top of that you see, is... Uh, well, it, it seemed a bit funny to us, but uh, that's what the Romans did. And uh, uh, Napoleon did the same sort of thing. Uh, this, uh, 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 if you've been in London, there's a place called Apsley House, sometimes known as Number One London because it's at Hyde Park Corner. And inside there, you've got one of the Duke of Wellington's souvenirs, a statue of Napoleon as the God of War, Mars. And uh, I'm sure the Duke of Wellington enjoyed looking at that. And uh, it isn't the only statue of Napoleon like this. There's one in Milan that I've seen. And uh, this is uh, uh, actually in the, the uh, uh, a courtyard at Milan University with the bonds, one standing outside. And the story about that is that Napoleon had it made by a, an Italian sculptor called Canova, but rejected it. And when I said, uh, why did he reject it, the chap who was showing it to me said rather slightly, well, the story goes that uh, the buttocks were sculpted so beautifully that Napoleon thought that Canova was having a bit of a go at him. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, coming back to, uh, uh, to the Romans, the, uh, the, uh, uh, this is Commodus, uh, as Hercules, you see, the same principle portrait head of Commodus, but with the club and the lion skin that lets you know that it's Hercules. And I've always thought that if I were a Roman emperor, I would have myself represented as Hercules. You know, that's how I would see myself, so you've got this. And, uh, so, so, so that's the... Uh, thank you, now, uh, uh, getting back to the workers at the mint, one of these inscriptions named 62 of them, with their different classifications, signatories, suppostores, and maniatores, and the signatories were all freedmen, so they are obviously of higher status. The um, suppostores, uh, one third freedmen, and the maniatores, a majority of them were slaves. So you, you, you can see that the difference in status there. At the end of the Maliatores, there are three others too. And I'm a bit uncertain about this because all the other workers were freedmen of Caesar, the, uh, uh, the emperor, or, or, or were slaves of Caesar. But these three don't have any sort of title. Now, mind you, being a freedman or a slave of the emperor, wasn't such a bad deal at all if you were working in a job like this. Uh, to be a slave uh, working in a mine or in a bottle, <laughs> not, I mean, slavery means different things depending on how lucky you are. 
And uh, nowadays, you see, we don't have slavery, we have mortgages instead. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just a different way of doing it. Anyway, uh, uh, we've got the signatories, suppositories, and maliatories. Asclepius Felicis, uh, Felicis means of Felix. I think this probably means that he is a slave of Felix, because a freedman could have a slave. Salustius Hermes, well that's a Greek name, to start, uh, first name Latin, second name Greek, uh, um, and Mevius Curdo, and that's an Italian Roman name. Uh, I'm not quite sure, they might have been free men who for some reason were working there, but uh, I can't explain those. And uh, anyway, that's 62 of them, plus Felix and a couple of assistants. And, uh, and then you've got, uh, so that's three administrators, plus 62 workers. And then another inscription names 25 Africanatores. We're not quite sure what they mean. By, by now, you've got over 90 people working in the Mint at that time. And quite possibly some others floating around and doing with different things. I mean, security guards, uh, cleaners, goodness knows what, you see. So, these titles, the suppostories, suppono in Latin means to put something underneath something else. So the suppostories are workers who place under. Uh, when you think of what goes on with minting coins, you have a flan which has been heated up, not melted, but just made hot to make it a little bit softer, carried in tongs to where it's going to, the coin is going to be struck. So that makes sense. Manuator is manual means a hammer, so he's just a hammer. No, no problem there. The signatories are a little bit different. They're people who put a sign on something. It's not, it's not signing a document. In fact, I've been trying to find out when your signature became the normal way of validating a document. And I don't think it really happens until perhaps as late as the 19th century. You, put, you can have your seal, uh, which is a different thing, you see, your wax seal. But uh, I, I don't know. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a passage from Shakespeare that I don't really have time to quote that, uh, in, in, in Twelfth Night, where, uh, but, uh, um, which suggests that it's a seal that really counts, and writing is mm, possible, but not, not, uh, not enough. Anyway, uh, uh, signare means to put a sign on something. Some people th think that they're die engravers, but uh, there are so many of them that that doesn't seem likely. Uh, in the 1950s, somebody in London decided he was going to engrave some ancient Greek coin dies. And after a bit of practice, he found, it, found that he could do one in about three hours. So in a day, he could do one obverse and one reverse die and have a bit of time left over, you see. So uh, you could churn out dies, particularly if you were fast, uh, very quickly. I remember once when I was in Naples and trying to get a particular kind of cameo being taken to a factory where somebody said, we don't have one, but I can do one for you in half an hour. And, and uh, uh, when he quoted the price, I backed off. But the, 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 the thing is that, that, that uh, cameos, that's a relatively soft material and you are, are uh, uh, also working in relief not in intaglio where you have to keep on testing it to see if things are going to come out the right way. But, 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 but uh, uh, anyway, th three hours for carving a die in, in iron and it, seems, it seems to me to be possible for somebody who's had a bit of practice. But uh, anyway, the uh, more interesting and recent interpretation, which can be more or less proved, is that they were the senior workers who heard the upper dies and had the responsibility for making sure that the right sign or stamp was put upon the coins. And that's why they got that title. Now, representations of minting, we've got a pretty, pretty representation from Pompeii, but I wouldn't take it too seriously because it's just an artist who is having a little bit of fun showing little cupids engaged in various activities such as chariot racing, you might see these particular pictures from Pompeii. Well, this one on the right, you've got a furnace where metal is being melted. Then you've got scales where metal is being weighed and then presented to somebody. And then you've got a couple of cupids hammering away. People think it might be minting, but 
uh, as I say, it's uh, not the sort of thing that you can rely on too much as a rep representation of the meeting activity. Uh, but uh, if I go back to this, one thing that uh, is that there's only two people involved here. One of them is holding what looks like pincers, and the other one is hammering away. Now, with coins, there are two ways of doing it. You can have what are called pincer dies, where the two dies are set in the ends of a pair of pincers, or you can have uh, an anvil with a die set in it, and a punch with a die set in the other end, and then you go bang, 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 like that. So the, the, uh, 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 we do have some pincer dies, but not as early as this. Uh, it, they're very late Roman or Byzantine. So, and uh, they really suit rather thinner uh, uh, coins than the sort of thick, uh, particularly the cisterces, the big brass coin that the Romans used. The only representation of uh, coining implements from a relatively early time comes about the time of Julius Caesar, when this particular mint magistrate advertises his occupation with this coin, where you've got uh, pincers uh, uh, on the left, uh, but not, it doesn't look like pincer dies, it just looks like things that you can carry a hot flan with. Then you've got an anvil and a hammer. But the real problem is this thing, because it doesn't look exactly like a coin die. And some people think that it's uh, symbolic of the activity. It's what you call a cap of Vulcan. Vulcan, the smith god of the Romans, had a, a cap like that. So, I don't know, uh, trouble is we, we've got uh, so often problems that we can't be 100% certain about. Here's a medieval example of somebody coining away, and this is definitely coining. You've got a little plan there which is about to be hammered, and it's exactly proportions, like so many medieval things are a bit out, but not to worry too much about that. Now, the really interesting thing is this it's, uh, it's not a coin, uh, it's about the size of a, a Roman cestercius, uh, it's about uh, uh, between three and four centimeters across in, in bronze, and it's, it's what we call a tessera. Tessera, you can use this word for the little bit of stone in a mosaic, but it comes in very handy in numismatics because it means I don't know what it is. And so uh, we, we don't know what these things were used for. Some people think that they were gaming pieces uh, uh, or, but, uh, or they, they were handed out so that people could uh, get access to something, but as I say, it didn't, it didn't really clear. Anyway, what is clear is that it, it can't be anything else but a scene of minting coins, where you've got the maliato on the left, and then you've got two other people. Well, working out just what's going on is a bit difficult, but it fits the idea of one of them being a suppostor who puts the, uh, bit, bit, the flan under on top of the anvil ready to be struck, and the other one is a signator who is responsible not only for holding the upper die, but making sure that everything's okay and the right things are being put on the coins, so therefore a more responsible job. Here's something else which seems to show something of the same kind. Uh, this is what they call a contorniate. These are a little this is a contorniate is something a little bit like a pistola, but the thing that all contorniates have in common is that they have this uh, sacco di contorno, as they say in Italian, this little groove all around them. And we don't know why, but they're not coins, and they are quite late, even though this shows Nero. We don't think it's of Nero's time, it's of the fourth century or even later perhaps. And on the back of it, You've got what seems like a scene of minting again. The, the, uh, uh, you've got six people here this time, but the three people in the middle seem to be more or less in the same sort of relationship as the one and the Tessera. So I think that we've probably got some idea of how these signatories, suppositories, and malleatories work.
club. The uh, African authorities, that's, uh, we don't really know what that means, accountants, clerical workers, sculptores, uh, 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 people who carve the dice, numulari, that can mean money changers, but it probably means accountants, uh, because with a mint you'd have to have people like that around. Flatuari, this comes from a Latin word which means blow in the first place, and then uh, it, it can mean, because you have to pump a furnace, uh, uh, people who, uh, who melt things down. So uh, uh, that might happen in the mint, or it might happen elsewhere. Dispensatories, to dispense something is to weigh it out, it really. So dispensatories are people who dispense things. Probatores, that means testers. Calatores. We haven't actually got a word that associates them with the mint, but I put them because some people think it means dye engravers. It, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a vague word, can mean engraving or modeling or something like that. But anyway, for numismatists, and this is where uh, everybody will get excited when I go to give this lecture in London next month, uh, because all the numismatists have got ideas about what an Ophikina actually means. It means workshop. What does it mean in terms of the coins? because you can look at the coins and look at the little differences and group them in, uh, in different sequences. But, uh, uh, well, as I say, I'll, uh, I'll stay with the details of that. But uh, uh, it, the word certainly is used for different groups producing coins within a mint. And uh, the best example we've got of this is a tombstone inscription it's not a very high class inscription, but uh, anyway, this is a Pelica. Uh, it looks a little bit to be Pelica, but Pelica is called uh, In Peace, in, fa in Faith in God. In other words, it's fourth century at least because it's Christian, who lived for years 23. He was a prepositus, he was in, an in charge person, Medias Tinorum of the workmen, Demoneta of the Kina Prima of, of the Mint. Uh, the first workshop. So that gives us some authority for talking about workshops. Certainly in the later Roman Empire you start getting numbers and the coins and then you can be certain about it. Uh, the person who's looked at the coins many years ago, uh, and I think this is something that needs looking at again, thought that there might be between five and seven different workshops in, uh, in Trajan's time, producing coins with slightly different things on them. That's what we think that Afikina really means. And, uh, of course, the importance of this is that the people who ran the mint would have to keep track of which particular group was responsible for producing which particular group of coins, because if anything went wrong, or if there were anything fraudulent happening, they'd want to be able to track it down to the appropriate people. Anyway, uh, uh, this five and seven of the Kina, mind you, you could have several different rooms used. I'm coming back to the question of why so many rooms in this cement building, uh, if there if there, uh, are between five and seven uh, rooms being uh, uh, of the Kina being used, then there's a lot of extra space. But uh, we're becoming more certain that <coughs> not only coins for the western part of the empire were minted in Rome at this time, but also for many eastern cities or not, not all of them. Yes, well, uh, coming back to what I said earlier, this is a good time for the mint workers. Trajan caused all the money that was on the way out to be melted down. A lot of the old silver coinage uh, in particular had got worn and wasn't the right weight and this was causing problems because with ancient coinage, up until that time, when the metal was pretty pure, it really mattered that you should get coins of the right weight. So Trajan uh, uh, ordered all the money that was uh, exitilos uh, on the way out to be melted down, which is why, if you're collecting Roman coins, coins before Trajan tend to be less common than coins after Trajan. Anyway, uh, uh, he... Uh, 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 he, uh, uh, he, uh, he also issued a number of restored coins, in other words, reproducing parts of what was on coins that had been, uh, um, uh, had 
been um, issued earlier. Here, for instance, you've got a coin of Tiberius. Uh, Trajan, this is rather interesting because we get a terrible report of Trajan uh, of Tiberius from the literary sources, but Trajan uh, chose only good emperors, so for Trajan, Tiberius was one of the goodies. And uh, then on the back, you've got something that copies. Uh, uh, on the front, you've got uh, Tiberius' portrait. On the back, you've got something that copies a coin of Tiberius, which shows Livia. Uh, but it's still got Trajan's name and titles around. So, so there's that one. Okay, well, why was this building so very big? I've got two suggestions, one I've made already, and that was that coins were made there, not only for Rome in the West, but for some Eastern mints as well. Also, the Arvarium, as you've known, storerooms do tend to become too small as time goes on. So that was probably what happened with that. They needed extra space, so the upper section of the building was probably located there. And uh, so that, that's my explanation. So finally, my conclusions that the building beneath San Clemente was probably the mint from the time of Domitian until the late 3rd century, and uh, uh, after the church was built on top, the mint must have been moved somewhere else, but we don't know where. And mint workers were imperial slaves and freedmen, a freedman, a freedmen, yes, and, uh, and uh, uh, were prosperous, so it wasn't a bad thing being a mint worker. <laughs>